across the Cadet, Sea Cadet. And we were uh, taking a trip to Comox on Vancouver Island in the summertime for uh, four weeks in July and August. And we had a stopover in Banff for a day. And at that stopover, I went and climbed up the back of Cascade Mountain up the trail to the summit by myself. And then on the summit, I sat there and dreamed about being a conqueror of Everest. That was a, that was a big highlight. Yeah. And, and, and in a sense, even though it wasn't a uh, difficult sort of ascent, that was my first climb. When you think about it, all that climbing around when you're a kid, with that, the back of your mind trying to be a, a person conquering some big peak, so you're always thinking that, and always trying to be there, even though your imagination is running wild, you're still actually out there doing things, and all that second nature that makes you good when you're older is developed when you're young. Yeah. And I think that we got that, even though we didn't realize we were getting it, and it wasn't a structured program for us. The Calgary Mountain Club was uh, very quickly the focal point of the, the climbing community. There were a group of people who were interested in, in doing a lot of uh, summer activities like Klaus Hahn and Noah Heinz Call was there and, and uh, Dieter Rabeck and uh, Klaus Hahn and Gunther Prince and there's quite a huge group and they're mostly Europeans but uh, not that that mattered. They were all interested in the same thing. They wanted to be out in the mountains. And that's where we were, every moment we could be. Yeah. We weren't working. The summer in there, uh, you went through a real shift in 62, 63, 64, 65. Uh, you developed in, you and Lloyd and, and Brian developed into the, the hot trio. It was an evolution because all of us were not content with that our level of uh, fitness, nor our level of ability. And with dreams, you don't say, well, why, why should I stop now? You just say, oh, I've done that. And now let's take a look at what's next. And we did have to push ourselves. We just were never content. When did you discover Yam Niska? When did you do your first climb on Yam? Um, that would have to have been with the Calgary Mountain Club. Uh, we stayed at the little lake at the bottom for two or three days. and. I went to Grill Marin and I did Calgary and and because uh, they were established routes, we were just taking a look at them and saying, "Wow, we thought they were great. Right? Yeah. They were fantastic routes. <laughs> Couldn't believe that because we hadn't done that much in terms of chimneys before. Here were two uh, beautiful chimney cracks. And we were thin and young and didn't probably get them done." Now Yamnaska just fit in there. We thought, ah, oh, this is a great training area because it's small, it's easy to get to. Uh, climbs are relatively short, all the summer are pretty long and dangerous, but we have to train here and train here and train here because we're going to be going into the bigger mountains. But that was the object, just to train on Yamnaska. Were you conscious of the fact that you were Canadian-born Canadians? That... It only came into play when people later on said, well, you're not European. I mean, me, I had a name that was European, so people thought I was anyway. And then when they heard I wasn't, they said, oh, you're Canadian. And I would say, yeah, what's the difference? <laughs> a lot of people were very uh, national, and, and um, they actually figured that, you know, Europeans were uh, foreigners, and they were dictating too much, and the Canadians weren't running the uh, commercial aspect of guiding and uh, standards and association yeah. business. Um, no, there, there was quite a uh, concern by a lot of people. And I think because they felt as Canadians that they were worthy and could do just as good a job and could do a better job, perhaps they, they could and they could have at that time, but they didn't have enough experience or drive to uh, meet the uh, demand that was being developed at that moment. Yeah. And the only people that did seize the demand and meet the demand were the uh, Europeans. And I took my hat off to them. I didn't think that was bad. Yeah. So you and Lloyd uh, hit it off right at that first meeting. And uh, yeah. two big climbs, of course, on Yamnuska or Forbidden Corner in the Bowl. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, Forbidden Corner is a funny one. Lloyd got for his birthday from Donna. <coughs> you probably know that story of a, a bivy bag. 
He did. He got a baby bag for his birthday. He said, I gotta try this out. I said, Brian and I were on Yamneska and we, we went up Forbidden Corner for a couple of pitches. I said, it looks like a great route. And there's a nice corner goes up 600 feet. And on top of the corner, when you look at it from glasses from the side and from a long way away, there's a ledge. Great spot for a good view. <laughs> so Lloyd said, all right, when can we get out there? No, it can go right away. And it, was in, it was late summer. So the opportunity to go occurred on Thanksgiving. Very warm. We had a very warm fall. But days were short. So we, we uh, got away at 11 o'clock from Lloyd's place in Harvey Heights, drove out there, got up to the base and started climbing. And when we finished climbing, just before dark, thank goodness, we were on top of the corner. There was a ledge, all those slope for that. And we bivied, we tested this bivy bag up. Terrible. <laughs> Next morning we got up and, and went to the top. We got on top at 12 o'clock. Uh, and there, in front of our eyes, was a Boy Scout had walked around the back. And he was 25 feet from the top. He had a canteen on him that was a three or four liter canteen. It's full of liquid. <laughs> so we got water. <laughs> But yeah, it was interesting because that climb was uh, done in a style that was dangerous. We would climb all these pitches with very little protection. Uh, I don't think we had more than ten pieces with us total. Uh, we used them every, well, we'd use them all up every pitch, but some pitches you only get them maybe 30 feet, maybe 40 feet. Uh, so the pitches went fast. And the line, the, the, the route finding was interesting. The first half was easy, but the second half, it's, I'm not sure why, but I had a, a, a head for lions and I would survey them somewhat from far and then get up close and, and in my mind it, I memorized the points that were important. So when we were climbing we would head and connect them all and that was uh, the route finding. But it was a marvelous climb. It was sustained, and, and we were climbing at, at that level. It didn't, didn't really bother us to be climbing and pushing ourselves out at that level. That big slab, which is a 40-foot high angle slab with very small thin holes on it, we just did in, in one run out from our last piece of protection. Um, then we got in one good piece of protection at the top of that diagonal run out, and from there we, we dropped down and went underneath a overhanging piece of whatever it was, rock was attached to the wall and came up the other side of that and on top of it and then moved back slightly and straight up the wall where the crux pitch was. So we got in one piece on this side of that big huge uh, glob that's on the wall and uh, that was it. There was one, two, there was, it was two pieces for 85, 90 feet of difficult, thin, crux climbing. So I guess the next year you did uh, the bowl. The dreaded bowl. The dreaded bowl, but you've been working on that one for a while. Oh, I had too, and mostly with Inga Steinbeck. With Brian Greenman earlier and then with Inga Steinbeck. And uh, I always felt so bad because we were only 50 feet from the top when we retreated the last time. I was, I was setting up all the rappel points and uh, we didn't have a, a master plan of uh, retreat. So uh, we'd end up uh, rappelling in the dark um, and surveying the, uh, the next rappel point from the rope on the way down with the flashlight in your mouth. It was not, uh, it was not <laughs> maybe character building, but not, not well planned. No. That was in the late summer and then the next year Lloyd and I went back up there and just went right through on one go. Yeah. Lloyd led that pitch I think. Uh, one interesting thing though, on that pitch I had I had the piece of protection on behind a flake, about thirteen feet down from the, the crux block that was loose. Uh, and when we got back there, I went up to that point and, and I replaced the pro and the flake came off. So I thought, wow, 
the, the, the lawyer said, that's okay, he'll do it. So I went down and the lawyer went up and didn't need the problem. He did it anyway. Lower down in the route, you had driven some uh, two bike fours into All oh, right. Sir. Yeah, that was protection on the uh, overhanging uh, crack that uh, is actually in the first pitch. Um, that was interesting. Worked well. Yeah. It was the right width, and uh, they went in about two feet, and then we just uh, had a sling around them because uh, the crack was uh, undulating, and uh, you could reach in and then slide it, slide it around and lock it in between points that couldn't come off. So that was our protection. Yeah, I think we put three in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those were two uh, standard setting climbs on on Yamniska at the time. Um, trying to think of what comes next. I guess. Uh, That'll be sixty-five, yeah. would it not? Yeah, that was sixty-five. Sixty-five. A couple of years later, you were on Howes. Right, with you and Lloyd, and was you and you and Lloyd and I? Yeah, we went halfway up. Right, and then there was Lloyd and I and Kenny Baker went yeah. back two weeks later. Yeah, well, tell, tell me about Howes. Uh, Howes stuck out because it's so huge. And uh, that whole wall from Black Chevron south over to, uh, well, all the way down to Patterson, even Crowfoot Glacier, that, all that huge things in there. And the biggest one was Howes. So, I always had in my mind that that was a huge, huge, huge climb. Had to be done. And obviously Lloyd did too. But we ended up talking about it for a couple of years. And Lloyd was a big push. He basically, he could organize things in a snap of a finger. Uh, he did, yeah. And uh, we got on it. You and I and Lloyd and looked at it. And, and then Lloyd and I and Kenny came back. Two weeks later, uh, we were chased off in the weather, um, and we did it in Calcares, right? Little rock shoes, we had crampons for them. <laughs> Not that fancy. Um, we had a lot of uh, problems in the upper stages, but the lower stages, because you and I and Lloyd had been there, went very quick. And the upper stage, um, again, when you when you're feeling fit and you are fit and you're climbing at a comfortable level and you're not afraid and you're so comfortable when you're extended. A lot of these things which are fairly challenging don't become that challenging. And I know that when we move fast, uh, after our bivouac, I had the morning lead, the first lead, which was straight up, overhanging actually, 150 feet, cold, icy. But I was so relieved to get out of my cramped position of trying to sleep that <laughs> I was overjoyed to be up there. Um, that gave us a little problem, not too much, a little bit. And then the next two pitches that were, again, fairly vertical, if not vertical, on some uh, thin, thin climbing. Lloyd did most of that. And then the last two pitches, which were on very high angle, totally iced over. Um, Rock. Um, I did that first lead, and we had we only had uh, a little bit of equipment. Like I think we had one set of crampons for the three of us, and uh, two ice axes. Uh, so we were under equipped. But uh, and then Lord did the the, the last lead, chopped his way through the corners. But both of those were interesting. High angle, very exhilarating. We were looking down on the lakes down below on the highway, just a little ribbon. The sun was beating on the ice, and some, the sun was coming up. It was a really amazing place to be. And at the time, you focus so hard that you don't realize that you're in extreme danger because the climbing was underprotected and and fairly difficult. But nonetheless, we prevailed and got to the summit. And then we had an argument about how to get back down. <laughs> and I kept saying that we should be going down between White Pyramid and Black Pyramid and, and through a call and dropping back down to the, the stair and crossing over on an old cable crossing there and 
they wouldn't buy it. And we had a democratic vote. There's three of us. I lost. <laughs> so we had to go all the way up to House Pass. 28 miles. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> you were right. Oh, gosh. Yeah, we thumped along until we got on top around noon. And we, and we kept going and thumped around at midnight or later. It was, a thunderstorm came along and it thundered and lightning and it poured. We were so exhausted. We were in the forest. Moss was about a foot deep. And I can remember falling over on my back and saying, I'm going to stay here and sleep. And the others laid down too. And I slept like that with the rain pouring on my face for an hour. Until it woke me up and I rolled over. So it didn't hit my face and slept again, just in the pouring rain. But it was quite warm. And for another two or three hours, then we got up and thumped our way out to Sketch and River Crossing. It was a great climb. The next climb on Yamnuska was called Wall. Yeah. The big climb, 71? Yep. Yeah. 71. Yeah. But we'd worked on that for uh, off and on for four years. Probably about six attempts. I think Charlie and I did two. Mm -hmm. We pushed it a lot, Charlie and I. On that climb, I remember using, like, on the first attempts, we, we used oh, ten different bolts. Uh, and then, you know, as we kept climbing it over and over again, we'd use less of them. So we got it down to where we were using three of the bolts right in the crux there. Um, and then, I guess, one of the big things about the bolts was <clears throat> they gave us added confidence, but if we didn't have them, we were a bit worried. So just getting a bolt in meant that we, in some instances, would have to uh, have something else in, like a hook. The hard part in that climb is in the very middle. You have three, four, five easy pitches of five, 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 six, five, seven, and then you have five, nine, five, ten. Interesting about five, nine, five, ten, five, ten, A, five, ten, B, C, D. I never figured that one out yet. To this day, I still. I, mean, I realize that if you're doing a lot, it's a little harder, so you have to create it a little harder. But to break it down so fine is kind of interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. And then there we were pushing onto that level and didn't even think that it was that level. Just that, hmm, it's hard. It's hard, man, it's hard. Five nine is the top, anyway. That would have been the, f the first climb in Mon Yam that had gone beyond five nine. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's just interesting to note that that they did that, and you don't even know at the time that you're doing that. And you're just sort of thinking, "Wow, this is interesting," and then you start focusing really hard. And you focus so hard that you can't even, you don't even see anything. The weather can start snowing. You don't even know it's snowing. It's so amazing how how you can focus and how well that makes you perform. It's amazing too. Yeah. <clears throat> so with that being up there so many times before before we got to the actual top because Charlie and I pushed two thirds of it so we only had one third left to go Tim and I and uh, once you got past the cracks like we didn't know Tim and I that it was going to get any easier and uh, it did it did it backed off like to 5.8 so like the last two pitches were just I mean, you feel like five eight. You should take the ropes off and put your hands in your pocket and <laughs> walk up. <laughs> it's just all of a sudden so easy. Yeah. But the chimney at the top was uh, nice rock, beautiful limestone, perfect, solid knobs, sharp, sharp edges. Even though it was slightly overhanging, it was just excellent. Missionaries, you did back there in the '60s. Now, mm. missionaries crack was your climb. Yeah, that was. That was totally my line and my climb, yeah. Yeah. And I pushed Brian to get up there and, and climb it, and we pushed it and pushed it. And yeah, I remember <laughs> the crux was interesting because it was sort of getting both of us. You couldn't have been able to protect that crack, could you? We did actually get... <clears throat> Brian actually went down another 50 feet and found the round stone and brought it up. And then I took it up and lodged it in, just below the crux. And there we put a nice sling on it. So the actual crux was was quite well protected. And the crux itself was 
for me that first time quite a lot easier than it is today. And I'll tell you why in a minute. There was a little jug handle on it. And that jug handle provided you enough to get up to another excellent jam for your hand. So, you know, in a sense you'd lay backing upside down, flaring, and then all of a sudden you're into that. So that was the key right there. Oh, and then you're, you're home free. Uh, but Lauren said, I gotta climb that. I wanna climb that. <laughs> so the next year we're back, Lauren. There. I want to eat that crux. <laughs> so we get up to that point, and, and Lawrence, and that jug handle, the end of it, he was hanging on to it, broke off. <laughs> oh, shucks. Of course, it, he, and he came down upside down, like he, he dropped down 15 feet. Uh, you know, with, with the 10 feet he had above the crux, above the protection, and that little bit of slack, maybe a little bit of pull in the rope. He, he came down 15 feet and swung upside down and his head was at my level, upside down. And I said, I guess you want me to do that. <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> I'm going to get that ring out. Lower me down. So I did and he just went like a rocket. <laughs> right up. But that, that hold, now with that little jug on it, now was just a, just an edge. Yeah. So it actually made it a bit harder. Yeah. What about Pangolin? Pangolin was nice. Brian worked out this system. He said, let's tie two carabiners onto the end of this short rope here, and we'll keep throwing them up until it jams into that crack at the top and behind that flea. So we kept throwing it. We finally got it. He hooked it in there. Got it in tight. And then uh, we, Dick and I, both said, "You're lead." <laughs> so what Brian actually did, he uh, he actually prosecuted. I think he prosecuted up that high up, and then got in the rock and, and climbed it and put some put in a piece of pro and everything. But uh, that was ballsy. Yeah, that was very ballsy. And then Dick was in the middle, so. Brian knocked a rock on him and hit him. Poor guy. <laughs> so we, I felt sorry for him at that point because he was getting knackered and he all of a sudden didn't want to be there anyway. <clears> then <throat> he had to go and climb it. So, but he did. And then when I came up, I didn't bother with the uh, prostate camp. I just sort of climbed back up and, and did that bridging and so on. And it actually wasn't that difficult. It went easier than we thought it would. Yeah. So yeah, we got over that and set up the top. But you know the climb that, that was the most rewarding on Yamnaska for me? It was corkscrew. Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah. Not because uh, it's uh, spectacular, but because there was Hans Fuhrer and myself and Brian. And uh, Lloyd and I had been there a few times. And I guess Lloyd and Brian had been there. And Lloyd did the bolts. He, he did all those bolts. And then they bagged it. It was getting too late. So we went back with... Uh, Hans Fuhrer. Now, Hans is a marvelous athletic person. He climbs really well, but <clears throat> he gets himself bogged down sometimes. And he was bogged in there and he didn't want to move left or right. And we were just before the bulls, we have to cross over to the bulls. Have you ever done that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and it's thin, it's kind of a thin traverse. And there's one piece of protection in the middle. We got to that piece of protection and he stayed there for And it was getting dark. He stayed there for half an hour. Gee, we talked to him, talked to him. Finally did it. He came over to where I was, and I was above the bulls. I had gone up to the end of the bulls and then moved off the bulls and got in a big piece of pro. And on belay, well, okay, he finally got there. And as soon as he got there, because it was dark, almost dark, I said to Brian, I'm, I'm taking off right now on the next lead because it's getting too dark. And Brian was saying, I don't think you should do that. I said, well, I can't do anything else. i got to do that. I must. No, and I said, no, don't worry about it. I'll put in pro, put in lots of pro. <laughs> so away I went, and it was good climbing, although five eight, and face climbing, beautiful rock, beautiful rock, good holes, nice little. So I just free climb, free climb. I got up 150 feet or something. And I said, oh, I better put some pro in. So I found a place for some pro, and then I went another 50 feet. And I said, oh, gotta get a blade. So I found a blade stance, and as soon as. Uh, 
Hands came up to me again. Same thing. I just went to the top. Same time of rock. Beautiful rock. Just got a top. When I got a top, it was dark. I don't know how those guys must have been climbing my braille. Yeah, yeah. But uh, to me, that, you know, for all the clients, that was the most rewarding because we were put in a situation that was demanding. And I thought, oh, afterwards, I thought, hmm, that was good. I think I did the right thing. And I, and I thought that was the best at that time. Yeah. But some of the some of the most rewarding climbing for me is not rock climbing. I like the I just kinda like the big mixed climbs. Like Howes Peak was really special. Yeah. Big, mixed, exposed. So uh, over the years, what's been special about climbing? Why why do you climb? It's interesting because when I when I look at my most precious moments out there, they they actually go back to uh, camaraderie and camaraderie with even yourself. But a lot of times, like a lot of climbing I've done has been with guiding. <clears throat> For example, when we had the Alpine Climb up at uh, the Moat Lake, well, I had one week off in the middle of that because I was going to climb a couple of people, Chris Jones and somebody else, and we were going to do a uh, the north face of Turret. Well, Chris couldn't make it. Huh? Okay, fine. Then, and Mike Wigley would come. And we'd do it. Three of us would do it. Well, guys, they couldn't make it neither. And like, they sent a message to the Alpine Club camp. And I had been on the Alpine Club camp for three weeks, and I was going to have the middle week off so I could do this. Mm -hmm. And I, so I had the middle week off, and I didn't have anybody to do it with. Then I ended up taking somebody, the strongest climber in the camp, and talking him into doing it. We did it. And that turned out to be an epic of huge proportion. We had the ice climbing on the bottom, and the, just getting onto the glacier, which was interesting, but not too, too bad. And then we had uh, three or four days of storm before that cleared off. And we didn't have access to a radio, so we didn't realize precisely what kind of weather was coming in. But it cleared up late that afternoon, totally clear, cold. And uh, I said, yeah, tomorrow morning, let's go up there. We got up there, but by afternoon, when we were on this huge snow slope above the glacier and before the final summit block, uh, very steep, we uh, started experiencing warm air, really warm air, and all that new snow. And he said, well, let's go back. I said, we can't. It's way too dangerous. We can't go back. So we went ahead. And, and then I said, there's going to be avalanches coming. We, we have to situate ourselves so that we're not going to be swept off. Um, you know, we'll move in a line that's got a rock sticking out so it splits anything. There we were, going straight up. Sure enough, down comes the first one. Splits off to the one side, right? Oh, this is getting scary. And then there's even getting worse weather. And down come another one, goes off the other side. Oh, man. All right, then we'll move over to where it's all avalanched off. Now it's bare ice. But that's okay. So we can climb on the bare ice and get up to uh, just blow the notch uh, between Turret and the uh, one to the west. We get up to that notch, just below that notch, and there's a great big vertical wall that sticks out. And it's got a flat top on it. 60, 70 feet high. For now, the ice is 70, 70 degree ice. Hard, just blue, dark blue. Just, you can just tick them in. You hit them too hard, they pop up, you tick them in. So I move out, and there's a big cornice up there. And I said, and he's saying, well, you know, I said, you have to stay here, because it's a huge cornice, but now it's starting to rain. It's very, very warm. And there's lightning. So I said, that cornice might fall off. No, I said, that cornice is dangerous. So I move out and I move up and there's ice and I put in an ice screw and I clip on. And then there's a huge explosion. The cornice fell off. <laughs> it's a huge cornice and it hit that flat piece and I'm just to the left of that. that and I hit that and just and it pours off there as a waterfall. And of course, I'm just clipped on very good. So it's just pouring down and I'm trying to, I'm going like this, <laughs> to make it 
<laughs> split off. <laughs> yeah, so that I don't get. Anyway, it all roars down. Hmm. Now, he's there and I'm there and I'm seeing. And it's starting with lightning and, and it's pouring. So we get up to the notch, which is another 80 feet of really, for me, a hard climbing because I only had one tool. So it's hard ice. So we got to that notch. Now I said, we got to stay here. And he said, well, okay, let's, let's go up in that ledge, that overhanging ledge. I said, no, it's lightning. We have to stay in the open. Well, we stay in the open on a down sloping ledge. I got this little baby sack. We get inside that. We eat the food we have and stuff like that. And it snows. It lightnings. It lightnings for the next three or four hours. And then it starts to snow. It cools, it cools right off. It snows 10 inches. <laughs> Gee. And I say, I'm sorry. <laughs> this might be a nightmare, but it's a, it's a good climb. <laughs> and uh, we can't be... And then the lightning's striking all around. And inside the tent, you get that almost fire, that blue flame, everything. <laughs> Quite a show, huh? And I said, that's why we're not in that cave. We can't afford to be a spark plug. So in the morning, you can't see a thing. <laughs> what did your client think of all of this? I'm not sure. He was very stoic. <laughs> he was quite nervous. Yeah. Actually, I got to take a couple of pictures when I was out there on that pitch. I never did get, never did got one of those. But I should probably ever find him again. But uh, he, I think he quit climbing. <laughs> He's never shown up since. Anyway, uh, it's been one ascent. It was done in the twenties, and it's those hard Swiss guides or something. And they went up this gully. And I said, we'll check it out. We'll check the first ascent route because I know it comes up this gully. So we walk over and we're looking down this gully. We're roped up, looking down this gully. All you can hear is you know, it's just stones everywhere. Roaring down it. And I said, suicide. We're not going down there. So we stayed there all day. And next morning, I said, we can't stay here any longer. So now we've been two days out. We don't have food left, so we thought it was going to be a day and a half climb. Well, okay, we have to climb the summit block, you know, the last 500 feet, or 400 feet to the summit, because on the map, the contours indicate that the south ridge, and I said, south ridge, not north, it'll probably be dry rock, or it'll just be wet from the recent snow, but it won't be ice. We'll have to go down, we'll have to go down that way. And we should be able to find it because you couldn't see 50 feet, 40 feet, 30 feet, you couldn't see. Just totally fog right in. And uh, so we went, kept my mitts on because everything was starting to warm up wet. You could just freeze your mitt onto the rock. All right, good. Pressure. Mm -hmm. So it took us four or five hours to climb that 400 feet because the conditions are so poor. We got to the summit. We knew we were on the summit because we were starting to inside. And uh, again, we sat down and had a powwow. He said, I don't think we're going to get off here. I said, oh, yes, we will. You just keep me on the rope on Belay, and I'm going to go down the south side. Compass. And I'm going to keep looking until I find the actual ridge. There's only one well-defined rib ridge on the south side. We found it. Mm -hmm. So then we started down climbing it and repelling down it. Um, not that much, would be 800 feet. And as we got right to the bottom of it, we got below the fog and we could see. Kind of up. So we went down another thousand feet and buried on the grass. And in the morning we went all the way around uh, the north end of uh, Geeky, mm -hmm. Geeky yeah. Meadows. Yeah. And they had a high camp up there. Oh, we went into high camp. Hey, how? Oh. <laughs> oh, just fine, <laughs> just fine. Yeah. Got some to eat. <laughs> Good. What an adventure. Huge adventure. Yeah. But that's the kind of situations that guiding has got me into too. And, and those, I thought, not highlights, but they're great. They're some of the better experiences of my life. Yeah.